morning, ladies. I'm so glad y'all could join us today um, for our ladies' Bible study. I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Irby if she will come. She's going to lead us in a few songs this morning. So if you will, turn in your songbook, in your notebook the, in the back, to page 8. Okay, now this song some of you may not have n known, but you'll see it goes through. It, you go through down there through the number 1, and then we go back to that little sign back there, and we do that last chorus again, okay, and finish off on that uh, last little phrase, okay? Turn over to page 11. I am so happy, and here's the reason why. I think it's all of us probably knew that as a child. Okay? page 17 and when Jesus takes our burden all away each day is sweeter than the day before We're going to get right into our lesson this morning. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Today we're going to be looking at the foolish heart. The foolish heart. Last time we met in February, we talked about the wise heart and how we need wisdom in everyday life. How that... Um, <clears throat> Wisdom is much more than a collection of rules related to our own preferences and traditions. And today we're going to talk about, um, continue that study on the heart, the foolish heart. And we're going to be talking today about the, the Pharisees. And, you know, as we get into our lesson, we need to be thinking of ourselves. We don't need to be thinking of other people in our lives. We need to be pointing the finger to me. How does this lesson apply to my life? I had to do this as I was studying. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're unfortunately thinking about other people when we are listening to preaching or teaching. We're not thinking about our own lives and how we need to change. And if you'll develop, try develop to develop a mindset of when you come to church or when you come to a ladies' meeting, um, a ladies' conference, um, anything where there's the, um, God's word is being opened and being taught, Lord, help me to open my heart, speak to me, 
Help me not to be distracted about something else or somebody else I'm thinking about that they need this message. We all need the message, no matter what it is. Um, God has given us people in our lives who teach us, and we need to listen. Um, he puts things on their hearts that we need to listen to. Um, we do not think that we are above the message because God uses people, human instruments in our lives to help us to grow in the Lord. Um, so I want you to open your hearts this morning. This is not directed. This message was hard for me. Um, it's, it just it hit me right in the heart. And I was like, Lord, I don't want to teach this. Because it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. And um, so I want you to have an open mind, and especially an open heart to this message. But today we're going to talk about a foolish heart. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for all the ladies that were able to be here today. The ones that couldn't be here, Lord, but are listening. Um, I just pray, Father, for them today. I pray that you would encourage their hearts, that you would uplift them. Lord, I pray my heart is racing right now, and I pray that you would just calm my nerves. A lot of times it's hard to stand in front of people. Um, and open your word, Father, when you know that the message has already spoke to you, but it's hard to swallow. I pray, Lord, that you would just help me right now. I need you. I need you to be with my thoughts, Lord. They are scattered. I need you, Father, to be with my mouth. Help it to be guarded. Help me to say only, Lord, the things that you would have me to say. Cleanse me right now, Lord, from any sin in my heart. Lord, help me to look to you for my strength today. And Lord, I pray that you would just bless and just guide, Lord. Just help us, Lord, to listen, to apply, to obey. We just thank you for your precious word. Lord, so many times we take it for granted. We don't read, uh, read it. We don't study. We don't apply. But most of all, Lord, we don't obey. I pray, Lord, that you would change that in our hearts. That you would help us only do those things that are pleasing to you, Father. I just thank you, Father, for all that you've done for me in my life. I'm not perfect. I just want to serve you with a whole heart, and I pray that you would help me to do that today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, at the top of our pages today, you see Psalm 107, verse 17. The Bible says, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted, or are afflicted. And today, like I said, we're going to be looking at the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Lord said unto them, why do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness? Luke 11.39. So today we're going to talk about what a foolish person is. Think in your mind, what is a foolish person? <clears throat> I wrote down some characteristics of a foolish person. From the book of Proverbs, the Bible says... They are wise in their own eyes. I'll try to go slow to help you um, be able to write down the notes. But these people are wise in their own eyes. Proverbs 12, 15. They will not listen to wise advice. They will not listen to wise advice. Proverbs 3, 35. 
Proverbs 3, 35. The next thing is they make a mock of sin. They make a mock of sin. That's Proverbs 14, 9. Proverbs 14, 9. The next thing that I wrote down, they are careless in their speech. They are careless in their speech. Proverbs 14, 7. The next thing I wrote down, I know you only have limited um, space. Just write it wherever you can. They uttereth all their mind. That's Proverbs 29, 11. They uttereth all their mind. Proverbs 29, 11. The next thing I wrote down is they are loud and they stir up trouble. They are loud and they stir up trouble. Proverbs 9.13 Proverbs 9.13 And the last thing the Bible says that I found in Proverbs um, despises his mother. Despises his mother. Proverbs 15 20 B despises his mother. Proverbs 15 20 B. <clears throat> so the foolish heart is a result of a spiritual starvation. Now we know that physically we can't go for a long time without food. Well, the, the same thing in our physical, um, our spiritual body. Um, in mind, we can't go a long time without the study of God's Word. Um, we have to read our Bibles and pray, and I know we say this over and over and over, but, you know, God tells us that in His Word over and over and over. So I guess He knew that we would have a problem with that. We need to read our Bibles and study His Word. With spiritual starvation, we lose our sound minds and we make unwise decisions. You know, wisdom takes effort. It takes hard work. It takes thought. But foolishness comes naturally, doesn't it? When we hear negative words like foolishness, oftentimes we're thinking of other people. We're pointing the finger at other people. We're not thinking about ourselves. And I know in my life, I make foolish decisions a lot. So I need this too. Um, but as we look today at the scriptures, um, at the scribes and the Pharisees, I want to ask you again, examine your own heart. Examine your life. See what similarities are there. And ask the Lord to help you change those. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, they studied and taught the Old Testament law. Um, they gave to the Israelites through Moses that... God gave to the Israelites and uh, through Moses. They considered themselves to be experts of the law. Um, they were always trying to answer the questions according to the law. But they had as a, a do as I say, not as I do kind of attitude. Reputation. Uh, the Pharisees were that, that way also. Not only the scribes, but the Pharisees in Acts chapter 23 verse 9. But for the most part, these were two distinct uh, groups. Now, the Pharisees were a Jewish religious group. Even though they knew the law, they had no regard for Christ. Jesus called them what? Hypocrites. Which was a harsh description. They were play actors. They wanted men to follow them and their traditions as a form of outward holiness. Jesus exposed their fraud with a lot of rebukes, with severe rebukes. And we're going to look at some of those today. But what is a hypocrite? You can say, oh, I know one. I bet we can all sit here and point fingers. We need to point the finger right here. Because we're all hypocrites. Somewhere in our lives, we are hypocrites. 
They are play actors. They are phonies. They are condemning and critical. They have a heart full of sin. They want to be seen of men. They want the approval of men. They want to be heard of men. They believe their own lies. They lead others astray. Jesus' most fiercest words were to these people. These people wanted to be seen of men. They were motivated by the approval of men and not of God. So let's look at chapter 23 and see how Jesus characterizes the Pharisees. Verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievances to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. Do you know what those are? Those were in Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe it is, when um, <clears throat> the Lord was telling them to write them, to um, give the scriptures to their children when they rise up, when they lay down, blah, 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 blah. Well, the, these were boxes they were to wear on their heads. Leather boxes, and inside they had the scriptures in them. Well, they were just little bitty boxes. Well, theirs were huge. I mean, they like the whole forehead, covered their whole forehead because they wanted everybody to see. That's what those are. And enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. So, these people wanted to be seen of men. They carried white trumpets when they went to visit the poor and give to the poor. When they prayed, they wanted to be heard of men. We saw that in verse 6. When they fasted, what did they do? They put ashes on their head and wore rags and walked around with a sad face. That's not what the Lord says to do when we fast. He tells us what? Don't tell anybody. Do it in secret. Um, I think many times we read over these passages and we think, oh, that was in that day. Um, we don't think about, no, that's the Lord speaking to us now. He wants us to hear this now. He is telling us how to behave. Don't do these things. He's giving instruction to us right now about our future. <clears throat> so let's look at some observations about these men or these people. Number one, their words were right, but their works were wrong. Um, in chapter 23, verse 3, the Bible says, And therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, and that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. So, Jesus was speaking both to his disciples right here we see and he was talking um, and the rest of the crowd not only his disciples but there was a multitude of people and when he told them to follow the instructions of the scribes and Pharisees but he was telling them you know you follow not everything is bad about these people right but there are things that are bad about them they say one thing and do another how often times are we like that in our lives we say one thing and we do another. And, you know, these, these men, um, or these, this crowd, of, the multitude there was probably thinking, okay, I'm a little confused. These are religious people, um, especially for the people that put them on a pedestal. How many times do we do that? We put people on a pedestal. Our pastor, 
You have to be very careful. How many of you can raise your hand? Don't. You can say, oh, I know of a pastor that used to be, but he fell into sin. He ruined a church. I've known many. And I haven't been saved that long. And it's a sad, sad day. But we're not to follow men because they're human, correct? Our pastor is a human too. He makes mistakes. And we don't need to put him on a pedestal. We need to respect him and his authority in our lives. But he's just a human. He's just a man. He's God's man. But we need to be careful when we put men on a pedestal. Because they will fall. Not all of them will fall. Many will fall. So we cannot put them on a pedestal. Um, the people were wondering, how can these people be wrong? They're our leaders. They're in charge of so much. And they're teaching the law of Moses. Um, but in verses 4 through 12, let's go on, start at verse 8. But ye not, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for only one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whatsoever shall, and whosoever, excuse me, shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that humble himself shall be exhausted, exalted. Jesus explained the inconsistencies of these men. And it is safe to say that they had issues. Lots of issues. But we do too. We as Christian ladies have a lot of issues. We may be in denial. We don't want to face them. But we have them. These uh, charges Jesus brought against these men are common to everyone. Men, women, everybody. We are prone to these same behaviors. Pride and motives. What is your motive for serving the Lord? Or motives for serving the Lord? So this passage of Scripture is a warning. It also, it's instructional to us. We have to be careful. Number two, the scribes and the Pharisees hindered others from coming to Christ. They hindered others. In 23.13, the Bible says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you either go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are entering to go in. What a contradiction. Or, you know, these... They hinder people from becoming Christians. And ladies, we can do the same thing by being hypocrites. When the scribes and Pharisees were teaching, they left God out of it. They shifted their focus to their traditions. And we do the same thing, don't we? Well, we've always done it this way. Do you know how many times I have heard that over the years? It's a tradition of man, people. Tradition, trad traditions come and go. It's okay if we don't do things the same way. Right? Yes, it is. When we become so focused on things that Satan wants to get us distracted with in the church, people are dying and going to hell. But we're so focused on the color of the carpet. Or we're so focused on the flower arrangement. God forbid anybody change anything in the church. God forbid if anybody changed the Christmas banquet. Or whatever you want to name it. Name it. Ladies, our church is not going to grow if we are standing on tradition. We need to be open to God's moving. People that walk in this church that may not be saved, but we're going to fuss and fight over things like this, we are never going to see people saved. With this nitpicking little junk that, that tears up the church. Think about it. 
It makes me angry. We're never going to win the lost. It hurts my heart. When we sit in our little pews, we won't go to the next side of the church and talk to people, visitors. Because we're too proud. We're too busy. Our church is not going to grow. We're not going to see people saved and discipled if we let this stuff get in the way. That's where my heart is today. The traditions of men is killing churches. It's killing it. All over America, churches are closing every day because of nitpicking traditions. Traditions are good, but when they are not focused on winning the lost, then we have lost our focus as a body of believers. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful. These people shifted their focus on their long list of traditions. The habit of measuring on the minors kept people from coming to Christ. It kept them under the heavy weight of the law. Think about you. If you grew up in a different religion, some of you may have this morning. Catholic, Muslim. And the day you got saved and you were free from all of that religiousosity, aren't you so much happier? Because Christ broke those chains of tradition. You don't have to go and pray to a priest. You know? That's what we're talking about. Traditions of men. That's what Christ was trying to tell them. Because they were unbelievers. These people were unbelievers. They were not interested in the kingdom of heaven. And I'm afraid that's where we are today in our Christianity. We're not worried about lost people. We're not worried about our church growing. We're not worried about new visitors coming in. We don't even invite people to church. I'm afraid that's where we are a lot of times in our walk. Missed opportunities every day of our lives. We're unfocused. We are hindering people from coming to the Lord. So allowing these people to follow God would have taken the attention off of them. Um, and the people would have cast doubts on their tradition. So they made it hard to find God. And they made it easy to follow them. So we must be careful that we are not hindering others when it comes to the gospel. Number three, the scribes and Pharisees were blind guides. Verse 24, verse 24 says, You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So used to, in, in back in that time, they would strain their drinks so they wouldn't get a gnat in it. That was part of their tradition. It made them holy, I guess. But they would swallow a camel. They wouldn't even see the camel. They would just swallow it. That's what he's talking about here. What a tr uh, contradiction it is. They were blind guides. How can a person that is blind be a guide? <laughs> I was sitting, I was thinking about that. I was like, okay. Well, this is another um, way of calling a person a know-it-all. When in reality, they are just pretending to be wise. Usually these types of people show their ignorance. Just wait a while when you talk to them. They show their ignorance. Even though these scribes and Pharisees were dishonest in their um, guidance, people continued to follow them. I wonder why. Well, we are the same way. Religious leaders who hide behind their positions to keep people from questioning them. Think about this. Leaders who hide behind their positions. Don't question the pastor. Says who? Says who? 
says who? It's okay if you have a concern. Ask the pastor. He'll be willing to show you why he made this decision. Don't be scared. It's okay. He's human. You can ask him anything. Hope. Just kidding. But people do that. Have you known religious leaders who hide behind their positions? And you're scared to talk to them? That not all ought to be in the house of God. It's okay to go. But these people usually get away with fraud. They're hiding something. It's wrong. These men made a big deal out of unimportant matters and neglected the essential issues. When Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees blind guides, he was saying they couldn't see well enough to lead anyone. They were masters at making things up and leading people astray. So we need to be careful in our lives that we are not blind guides. You know, people are watching you and me. They're every day, they're watching us. We may not believe it. Our neighbors, they're peeking out the window. They're seeing what you're doing. Everybody's going to go home and close all their curtains. <laughs> but I'm serious. People are watching us, and we need to be careful that we're not leading others astray. Number four, they were pretenders. Verses 27 and 28, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of men, dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So, there's a tendency for us as Christians, I'm guilty, of having um, our own little grading system. And we unconsciously score ourselves and others as well. Let's check off the blocks. Well, I go to church on Sunday. I go to Sunday school. I go to Sunday morning. I go to evening service on Wednesdays. I teach a Sunday school class. I do bus ministry. I work in master clubs. I do the ladies' fellowship. Mm. Sing in the choir. So we have all of these lists of things that we do. And But when we equate our man-made list of spiritual activities with Christian living, presuming that if we are touching all the bases, we are better than most people, we are misleading ourselves. Just because we are active doesn't mean that we're doing right. We're always ready to point the finger. Christian living is much more than coming to church every week. In and out, every service, every special meeting, we're here. We're the first ones to raise our hands when help is needed. But we have to remember that we have to be yielded to the Lord. That's what our relationship with Christ is about. Our yieldedness to Him. You know, God designs the pattern for our lives. And He defines, He defines what is acceptable in our lives. God, His Word, not what we think, not our opinion. Um, calling someone in the Bible a, a white sepulcher was not a compliment. When Jesus rebuked these men, he used word pictures to do it and to emphasize um, his pure dislike with their insincerity. Uh, insincerity, sorry. Jesus was pulling back and revealing the backstage of these lives, these pretenders. Christ could um, see the true motivations of their foolish hearts. 
these evil people were pretending to be godly. So whatever, what is our motive for serving the Lord? Why do we come to church every week, every time the doors open? Think about it. Why do you do it? Now let's make application to our own lives. Number one, our actions and words should be consistent. Luke chapter 12 verse 1 says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, and so much that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Our relationship with Christ should affect our lifestyle. We just heard that. Well, well my husband's been preaching on it for a while. The closer we are to Christ, the more we desire to display characteristics that resemble Him. We are to be, you know, He's conforming us to His image if we wanted to, if we let Him. If our relationship with Christ is shallow or superficial, we will be more inclined to inconsistencies in our behavior. We have to remember again that people are watching us. Our children are watching us. Our grandchildren are watching us. Our neighbors are watching us. Our co-workers are watching us. They see the inconsistencies in our lives, in our behavior. And, you know, one of the most, um, I guess you would say most frustrating in, um, messages that we can send out to people is do as I say, not as I do. How many of you have heard that, maybe from people in your own lives? I hate that saying, you know? It is hurtful. If our lives do not line up with our message, then we qualify for the same title that Christ gave to these people. Hypocrites. Pretending to be godly and holy just because we're keeping some kind of mental checklist. That's not the same as living a godly life. You can fool others. I can fool others. But we cannot fool the Lord. He sees us. Everything we do, everything we say, every part of our life, God sees. Godliness is in, in, eternal. It's internal. It's not like putting on a piece of clothing. It's deep in the heart, being godly. Number two, we do not, uh, we do not want to become human roadblocks to salvation. Sometimes the biggest roadblock to someone being saved is a human roadblock. If you're trying to win somebody to the Lord, you need to be consistent in your lifestyle. They're watching you. Um, I need to ask myself, is there anything that I am doing that would hinder somebody from being saved? It could be anything. It, it doesn't have to be like physical. It can be. But it could be our speech. Being critical being hateful, being judgmental. All of that is sin. It could keep somebody from being a, a Christian, y'all. For winning somebody back from, um, who's backslidden, her speech could cause him not to come back to the Lord. We have to think before we say things and do things. Is this going to ruin my um, testimony for the Lord? Because people are watching. Um, if we have elevated our traditions above the gospel, we are getting in the way of Christ. Another way we hinder someone, as I said, is inconsistent uh, living. If our lives are no different than most, like the unbeliever, then how... Are they going to say, oh, I want what you got? Because your life is different. I see it. I, something's different about you. 
When I, um, when we were in Tennessee, I worked at a little, like a 7-Eleven. It was a little country store. It wasn't a 7-Eleven. Um, but we had a restaurant and we had a convenience store. And I worked there from 3.30 in the morning until noon sometimes. Sometimes it was 10. And he, um, sometimes it was later. Just depends on when I was needed. But anyway, um, sometimes I would work overtime because one of the girls was sick and couldn't make it or whatever. And I grew up with these people. They knew me before I got saved. They knew that I partied, that I was a druggie, that I drank, because I used to do it with them. They knew me. That's not something I'm proud about. But it allowed me to be able to share my testimony with them, and one of them got saved. But the longer I worked with them and I listened to their smack talk and their what they did on the weekends and then they would come in on Monday morning and dragging, not wanting to work, you know, it was like pulling teeth to get them to do stuff at work and um, they were like, well, what did you do? I said, I went to church. I served the Lord yesterday, our family, and well, oh, do you think you're better than me? No. You know. You know how I used to be. And you can be that way too. You can be like me. You can have a joy and a new life in Christ. So they watched me for a long time. They even, one of them even offered me drugs. And um, I'm like, no. Jesus Christ changed my life. And I never want to do that again. And so I said, why don't you come to church with me? And uh, she's like, well, I'll think about it. And her life was a mess. She was in and out of rehab all the time. And she had two children. She couldn't take care of them. I just really had a burden for her. I just prayed for her every day. That the Lord would help me to be consistent and walk the talk. Because it was hard when you're, you know, if you've ever been in the setting where you've got lost people all around you all the time. It's difficult. But she came to church with me and she got saved. And I worked with her and discipled her. Unfortunately, she chose to go back to drugs, ended up in rehab, and I hadn't heard from her since. But people are watching us, and we don't want to become a roadblock. So we have to be careful. Is there anything I'm doing that would cause a person from wanting to be saved? Um, we have to be consistent. If we are born again, we are new creatures, we should not live like the world. We are different now. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are, uh, represent the, Christ, um, the interest of Christ in Christianity. Number three, without Christ leading us, we will make or guides ourselves for others. And he spake a parable unto them in Luke chapter 39. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? When there are inconsistencies in our lives, we have to um, have the potential to infect others with our examples, just like we were talking about. We can easily become blind guides with critical spirits, picking apart things we think others are doing wrong. You know, we can sit around and gossip about people all the time. We don't need to do that, ladies. It's none of our business. If we are not part of the problem or part of the solution, we need to keep our mouth shut. Correct? Don't get involved with gossips. That tears down the church. That hurts people. We need to be careful what we say. We have to be careful with our critical spirits and picking people apart. You know, we can point the fingers at everybody else, but like I said, we need to point right here. Because we are not perfect and we have inconsistencies in our life that we need to get right before we're pointing at everybody else. Everyone has a circle of influence, like we said. Friends, family members, co-workers, they're watching us. They're watching our lives. And 
um, and absorb our messages that we're getting, giving them. Um, even our behavior speaks. And we may be leading others in the wrong direction unintentionally, you know. Um, but the outcome is the same. We sow seeds of confusion. Like our children, they see us do one thing, we say another. Um, we have to be careful. Because they know. They know when we're real. Um, it, it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul made a bold statement. What did he say in that verse? He said, Be you followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. So we need to ask ourselves, would it be safe for somebody to follow me? Would it be safe? Number four, hip Hypocritical living is pharisaical. 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 Say that fast. <laughs> Can you spell it? No. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but in their heart their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Now don't you love it when people are just real? I do. I hope I'm real to y'all. I hope I'm not a fake. I hope you don't look at me and say, oh my gosh, she's such a fake. I know people like that right now. It makes me sad. It breaks my heart. Just be real. I think I taught a Sunday school class on that before. Just be real. People don't like fakes. And I told y'all when we came here, what you see is what you get in me. In the Lord. In the Lord. I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect pastor's wife. I never claim to be. But I want to be real. I don't want to be a fake person. You should be want to be real too. A lot of people turn people off because they're fake. And they're roadblocks by being fake. Pretending to be righteous while holding to a performance-based list of activities characterizes pharisaical, I can't even say it, pharisaical living. This misplaced attention on measuring others leads to a critical spirit. Do you have a critical spirit? Are you always putting people down? Are you trying to see the good in others? Or do you always see the bad? Judging. You need to be careful. Very careful that we're not judging when people walk through the door, that we're not judging them. One day when we stand before Christ to give an account to Him, I'm not going to give an account for you, and you're not going to give an account for me. We're going to give an account for ourselves. You know, hypocrisy is hard to mask. You can get away with it for a little while. But the true you is going to come out. And people are going to be able to see it. I'm going to share this with you. When we were in Japan, it was family in our church. <clears throat> They'd been there seven years. This man was a deacon in our church. He preached many times in our pulpit. He was there before we got there to this church. Four children. A nice wife. Very quiet. And he was um, in, enrolled. He was in the Air Force, but he was enrolled in Liberty University getting his doctorate. He wanted to be a pastor someday. So, I don't know, we were there four years maybe. And um, 
something happened in their family. They um, were different. They started acting differently. His, um, his behavior changed. His wife's behavior changed. And one night, they were at a restaurant out in town, him and his wife having dinner. And one of our other families, who was a Japanese family, um, the daughter was in our Christian school, they were at the same restaurant. She was a teenager. She was 16 years old. She was half American and half Japanese. And a few weeks after they saw this family at the restaurant, she came to me. She was just crying her eyes out, so upset. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? She said, I got to tell you this. I can't do this anymore. I just got to tell somebody. I can't keep it in. And I said, okay. Well, I saw this family, this man and his wife, and you know them. And they were drinking. They were drinking alcohol. And I don't understand. He's a preacher. He's taught our Sunday school class. She was just destroyed. Overseeing them drink alcohol when he has preached against it himself. So, I was like, okay. Somebody's going to have to say something to them. So, my husband, he was a pastor at that time. He was like, okay, this is what we've heard. We need to know if it's true. He's like, well, yeah, it's true. And, you know, the jaw drops. And then the knife goes in your heart. Because you're working alongside very, very, very closely with this deacon and his family. You didn't see it coming. We had no idea that they were one way in public and one way in private. Now, he just ruined his testimony with this young girl who was really just getting started in her Christian walk. 16 years old and was crushed because she was best friends with his daughter. She took her Christianity very seriously. This girl did. When she got saved, she got saved. Coming from a broken home. Just very poor. So the church was her life. Jesus was her life because he gave her hope. So we were just crushed. Just crushed. It was depressing. So what do you do in a situation like that? Well, he needs to repent. They need to repent. And thankfully they did. They repented of their sin. He stepped down as a deacon and everything else he was doing. But they weren't cast out from the congregation. Nobody else knew. Nobody. To our knowledge, nobody knew. We didn't go around gossiping about it and spreading it. You don't do stuff like that. You embrace. You pull them back. You help that family. Everybody can fall into sin. But what do we want to do? We want to kick them. We want to point the finger. We want to cast them out. We don't want to help them. Because it's too much work. It's too hard. Sadly, after they left 
Japan. The wife and husband divorced. She didn't want to be married to a preacher. She wanted her freedom. But he is still serving the Lord today. She's not. Their children were very hurt by everything. Because they saw, they, they knew the inconsistency of the mom and dad in the hall. And how they pretended at church. So their lives are, were a wreck. None of them are serving the Lord to my knowledge. I still keep in touch with their daughter. But the inconsistencies and being a hypocrite is real. And we have to fight against it, ladies. Because people are watching us, even when we think they're not. Our children are watching us. They know when we say one thing and do another. Do you want your kids to serve the Lord for the rest of their lives? Then be consistent. I'm not saying they won't go their own way. They will. But they will come back if they are accepted and loved and cared about and not judged. But we have to be careful because those little eyes, big eyes, whatever, are watching us. And they know if we're hypocrites. They can see it a mile away. So we just have to be careful that our lives are consistent, that we don't have a contradictory behavior. Our relationship with Christ affects our behaviors and our beliefs. If we have a shallow relationship with the Lord, then our interactions with people will be shallow, they will be superficial, and they will be conflicted. Just be real. Just be real. If we can um, think we can fool people with our hypocritical living, then we are mistaken. Even, like I said, young people know if we're real, if we're genuine. Hypocrisy breeds an imbalanced person with an inflated sense of self-importance. This is why hypocrisy and entitlement often go together. When we are not meek and lowly, we will struggle with thoughts of being high and mighty. This is a form of spiritual warfare that we're going to battle for the rest of our lives. We're going to battle this for the rest of our lives, being a hypocrite. And I heard for, I probably even said it before I was saved in my own life. But I remember going to school with girls when I was like in my senior year of high school. We had gone to school with these kids since I was in kindergarten. And oh, yes, they were so spiritual, but I knew what they were doing. I knew what they were doing. They were doing some of the things that I was doing as a teenager. Yet they were in church every Sunday. They were at Bible study. They were at kids club. But they weren't living for Christ. So it's important that we teach our children also. You need to do the right thing. You need to walk the walk. Walk the talk. You know. Be careful. Don't be inconsistent. So this, um, like I said, this is gonna. This is one of the spiritual battles that we have to engage in, constantly. Being a hypocrite, the risk of developing a foolish heart exists at any stage of life. The power of peer pressure is not only limited to the teenage years, and our choices of friends will always matter. Be careful who you're friends with, because they will lead you astray. The scribes and the Pharisees were humans. They suffered the same flaws as we do today. But we need to be reminded that um, it's a continuous battle. When it, uh, when it matters to God what God thinks in our lives, then we will make wiser choices and decisions. We have to examine our hearts regularly and look for any signs of foolishness and hypocrisy. We need to write them down. We need to pray about it. And I started a list. Um, am I a hypocrite? Ask yourselves these questions. 
Do I know the truth, but I fail to obey it? Is there anything in God's Word that He has told you and you're not doing it? Then you're a hypocrite. Let that sink in. If He's told you something you shouldn't be doing and you're doing it, then you're a hypocrite. Are you able to do things that are right and good without letting others know? Or do you have to tell others what you've done? Oh, please put my name in the bulletin because I did this last week. I've heard people say that. Really have. Do you live a self-serving life? Do you love leadership position and control? Not because you want to serve others, but because you want the pat on the back. Or uh, do you reduce your faith to rigid rules? Oh my, we got to obey the rules. If we don't, we got to tell them. Do we have to obey the rules so rigidly? Outward conformity without inner reality. You might look good on the outside, but your heart's black as sin. You know somebody like that? Is my private life consistent with my public image? Look. Are you fake? Am I the same? Do I get upset when someone else gets the credit for what I have done? Can you just believe this? I did that. But she got the credit for it. What is... I've heard that one too. Do I accept praise for something that I have not done? Do I love the praises of men over the praise of God? Or do I say, Lord, I don't care what others say or think as long as I please you. Am I defeated by the hypocrisy of others? This can make us discouraged, can it? When we see people not living for God, being hypocrites. If so, then I am one too. As long as we live, we have hypocrites around us in all walks of life. As long as we are not a hypocrite, then we don't have to worry about those who are. If we let a hypocrite come between the Lord and uh, us, then we are closer to God. They are closer to God than we are. Another story. Got about two minutes. My mom was saved in 1993, actually 94. Uh, I had been witnessing her to her for many years after I was saved. I was saved in 1989. So all those years I had been witnessing to my mom. We were in Japan, stationed there, and she was in Tennessee. And she would get angry at me for bringing God up. She didn't want to hear about it. She didn't want to hear about salvation. And I tried to talk to her, and she slammed the phone down mad. Never understood it. I know it's probably because she was under conviction. But um, we came home in 1994. I was pregnant with Haley. We were going to Bible college. And so I asked Mom if she would come and stay with me or stay with the kids while I delivered Haley. And she agreed, which I was very surprised because my mom doesn't go anywhere. She said she would come. And um, I said, you know, we'll be going to church, so if you want to go with us, you know, bring your Bible, if you have one, whatever. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that. You're welcome to come with us. She's like, okay. So anyway, she knew, you know, we were... Um, going to church that Sunday. So she got there. We spent the whole week together. and um, I was really pregnant with Haley. And we, we went to church that Sunday. And I told our pastor a few weeks before, I said, um, my mom's coming. And I'm praying that she'll come to church with us. I invited her. And I said, um, will you preach a salvation message if you see her, you know? And he's like, well, I always do. And I'm like, well, I know that, but... <laughs> 
if you see her walk in with us, I don't know, say something that might urge her to get saved more. He's like, okay, okay. So the whole church was praying for my mom. And um, so she came. She did. That Sunday morning, we got up, get ready for church. She comes out at like 7.30 and says, I have a headache. I'm not going. So I'm just in tears. She told us the night before that she was going to go. She didn't go. I mean, she did go. She came back out and was ready when we were fixing to leave. So I was so excited. I was just praying, oh, Lord, please save her. Please save her. And so um, we got through Sunday school, and everybody was really friendly to her and nice. And So we were sitting on the third row from the pulpit, and um, our pastor preached a great message that morning, and, and the invitation started, and um, just as I am, and she didn't move. The first verse, she didn't move. The second verse, she didn't move. And I'm like, I heard people sniffing, like crying. So that got me started crying. And it's like the whole church is crying, right? Because they wanted my mom to be saved. And so the third verse, she didn't move. So on the fourth verse, I mean, I was just a squalling. And I was like, this might be her only chance. So I grabbed her hand and I just held it. And she leaned over to me. And she said, I want to get saved. So she went down forward, and I asked my pastor's uh, mother. She was sitting in the next pew over. I went and got her. I said, what are you doing with my mom? She's heard it from me so many times, and she's just hard. So she led my mom to the Lord. That was in 1993. So I'm so excited. Get her back home. What are we going to do? We need to find a church. The church on every corner where I'm from. But they say they're a church, but they're really not. So I was like, hey, Lord, you got to provide a church. you got to provide somewhere for her to go. So we did find a little church. They um, rented a storefront. I knew the guy. Uh, my brother went to school with him. Um, his daddy was a preacher, a very good preacher. I used to go and hear him when I was smaller and growing up. And um, Pastor Shutt was his name, and um, his son was a preacher. So he was starting a little church. So Mom went, and my sister went with her. My sister had been saved the year prior. I led her to the Lord. And um, so I was so excited. I went with him, and um, he preached the Bible. Very strong preacher in his 30s. And um, so Mom was going. And she was praying about getting baptized. She's so scared of water. She never went to the creek with us or anything. She just could not stand to be around water. So I was like, Mom, you really need to be baptized. You know, you really do. It's just a obedience to the Lord. It's the next step. It's gonna, you know, you need to grow. You need to get baptized and join church. So she built up her, you know, she's like, okay, I'm gonna get baptized. So I'm going to go down there. We were in Chattanooga. She lived an hour and a half from me. So I'm like, okay, we're going to come for your baptism. So we went for her baptism. She got baptized. She was going faithfully about six weeks later. Huge, huge, just dagger in my heart. Pastor ran off with the secretary. It killed my mom. She was so excited about that little church. She was growing. My mom has not set, stepped foot in church again. I'm not saying she's right at all, because she's not. But she's like, he was a hypocrite. Can't trust and I kept telling her, Mom, you can't let that keep you from going to church because there's hypocrites everywhere and you're a hypocrite and I'm a hypocrite. In some way, I'm a hypocrite. And I said, you can't. You're going to answer to God. You're not going to answer to these hypocrites. Still to 
today, she will not go to church. So we need to be careful. We not, may not be outwardly involved in a huge sin, a little sin, whatever. But the sins of the heart often will make us hypocrites. Our speech, criticizing people, judging people for the way they look, the way they dress. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth. Proverbs 18.13 are the sure signs of a foolish heart. So I hope that we will take what we've heard today and heed it. Just be real. And pray, Lord, if I'm being a hypocrite, show me. Help me not to be one. Because we all have a tendency to be one. And we must take heed. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had in your word. Lord, it was a hard lesson for me. I just want to be real. I just want to please you with my life. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would want that same thing. That we would want to not be a roadblock. Not to be a blind guide. To live consistently with the Bible. Not to think we're high and mighty because we do live by the Bible. But just be real so we can reach people. Not to be a hypocrite. Not to be judgmental or critical. Lord, that's being a hypocrite. Help us to love people, Lord are dying and they're going to hell. Help us, Lord, to, to love you. We say we love you with our mouth, but many times our heart is far from you. And I just pray, Lord, that you help us to be the right Christian, the one that honors you with our lives. So many say that they are. Just help us, Lord. None of us are perfect, Lord. But a lot of times we think we are. We say that we're not. Perfections, Lord, they don't line up with your word. We don't obey your word. pray, Lord, that you would just help us with this continuous battle. We pray for our church, Lord, as a whole. Lord, we pray for new believers, Lord, that you would give us fruits for our labors. Help us, Lord, to see people saved and to grow, to be encouraged and discipled. Help us to teach them how to serve you, Lord. Just thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you for each home that's represented here. I pray that you put a hedge about it, Lord, and protect these families. Lord, these are good women. And I pray that you would help them, Lord, to become more like you every day. And I pray for myself, Lord, that you'd help me to be a leader, Lord, that's real that walks the talk. Lord, I failed you so many times. And you've always been there to pick me up and forgive me. And I thank you for that. We do pray, Lord, for the ones that couldn't be here today, that you would watch over them. Help them, Lord, to be able to gather next time with us, Lord. 
We just love you and thank you and just praise you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. You're so good. Even when we don't obey you, Lord, you're so good. Help us, Lord, now with the rest of our day. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you ladies for joining us today.